The scripture reading today, Matthew 5, 43 through 48, page 1503 on your Jew Bible or up on the screen. Love for enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. May God add a blessing to his word. Chasing perfection. Why can't we be more like Jesus, who was the author and perfecter of life? What does it mean to be perfect? You know, my brother-in-law Bobby was a great ball player. He probably could have gone pro if he would have pursued it, uh, but he did play a lot, and uh, by the time that we actually got together, he was playing softball, and, and he was, he was a, a player who had a over 800 batting average in softball and that was pretty impressive you know and so I asked him I said Bob how do you do it and he says practice 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 and so I would go out I'd go to the batting cages and I would do everything and I, I would spend sometimes hours at it and the best I could ever ma do was 528 in a season about half the time you know, it's not easy to be perfect. Another great sports legend named Bob Gibson, who played for the St. Louis Cardinals, was a dominant pitcher in his era. He was a nine-time All-Star, won the Cy Young for being the best pitcher and the Most Valuable Player Award in 1968. He finished that incredible season with an incredible 1.12 earned run average. And for those of you who don't follow baseball, it meant that and he had 28 complete games, he allowed one run per game. And you would think that if you could pitch and only allow one run per game, you would win every game, right? He had nine losses that season. It was 22 and nine, and, uh, and, and the Cardinal team just couldn't hit. And when asked about that season, Gibson said that he felt he had to be perfect every time out or else he'd lose. Now that's incredible pressure, to believe that you've got to be perfect every time. If I worried about that every time I got in the pulpit, oh, I don't think I'd be here. The stress would get to you. But some of us live our lives with that kind of pressure driving us. It's, we believe it's all on us, that we have to go out every time and hit a home run. We have to go out every time and we have to be perfect in everything we do, whether it's at work or whether it's to be a perfect parent or a perfect student. And that pressure can weigh on us. Whether it's a desire to please others or a drive to live up to some self-imposed standard or even an obligation to try to live up to the expectations given us by our understanding of our faith we can end up exhausted and never reach our goals. Because striving after perfection is something that very few ever reach for very long. Even Gibson was only able to do it one season. He had some good seasons. But perfection is rare. As we continue our series on, on chasing carrots, I want to talk about this need that some of us have for being perfect. And some of you are sitting here and says, I don't have that problem at all, right? But I'm sure there are a few of us here who strive and we want to do, we want to be, we want to, we want to have that sense that we have perfectly done what we're doing. And we say, if only we can get this perfect, then we'll be good. Now let me say, there's nothing wrong with striving for excellence. And I'm separating excellence for perfection. The Apostle Paul encourages us to strive for excellence in so many places. And first, in Colossians 3, he says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Strive for excellence. Do the best as if God was your boss, if God was your coach, God was your, your teacher and mentor. Work with it with all your heart. 
paraphrasing what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, we read that we should run with purpose, fight with all our might, and work out with all our heart so that we won't lose out on the prize. Give it your best in everything you do. Strive for excellence. In 1 Timothy 6, he says to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. In other words, in all of these things, we're called to do our best. And so when I say that we we have to stop striving for perfection, I'm not saying that we shouldn't keep doing our best. But if you're driven for perfection, you're going to end up being very disappointed in life. The unhealthy pursuit of perfection in order to meet outrageous expectations can literally sap us of our strength and draw us away from our calling to serve God. The truth is that no one is perfect. No matter how hard we try, we'll never be perfect. Maybe we'll get a momentary glimpse of what it's like. But then that will pass and we'll still be chasing the carrot. No matter how hard we try, It seems like when we're striving for perfection, it flies in the faith of something that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. You know, in verse 48, what Steve read, it ends with this, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And I've always read that verse to mean that I should do everything I can to be more like Jesus, because Jesus is the only perfect person who's ever walked the face of this earth. And so sometimes I wonder why I can't be more like Jesus. Maybe you've wondered that. You try, you try to maybe ask yourself the question, what would Jesus do when you're facing some decision or whatnot? And we often try. And sometimes we stumble and fall. I want to walk like him. I want to talk like him. I want to live like him. I want to love like him. I want to forgive like him. Unfortunately, And this is my confession. I start drifting from that standard of perfection almost from the time my feet hit the ground in the morning when I wake up and get out of bed. Sit there and say, okay, today's the day. I'm going to be like Jesus. Then I go into the bathroom and boom, I look in the mirror and I say, nope, not today. How about you? Maybe you have that feeling too. To be perfect like Jesus, though, means never sinning. It means not being critical or judgmental of others. It means offering grace and forgiveness to those who have hurt you. You know, there was a time in my life where I had a hard time saying the Lord's Prayer. And you said, what do you mean by that? Because when I came to that part where it says, forgive us our debts, our sins, our trespasses, as we forgive others, I don't know if I wanted to say that. (laughs) Because I wasn't always so good at forgiving. And if I want God to forgive me like I forgive others, I'm in trouble. It's just too hard, and I think that's the point, that we can't be like Jesus. We can try. We can work at it. We can continue at it, but we're not Jesus. You know, if you look at this passage in Matthew chapter 5, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount, and you look at the context of where Jesus says, be ye perfect. He's talking about the full extent of the law. He's really calling people and sharing with people what the law says in the Old Testament, the the Ten Commandments and and the 600 plus laws that come to us in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And and so in this passage, he kind of lifts up a few things when when he kind of precedes this passage about perfection. He says, he talks about murder. And most of us can say, we got that one. We're good. I never murdered anybody. I wanted to. Well, oh, okay, there, that's where he gets you. Because he says, if you're angry, if you've used a bad word, if you've ever flipped anybody off, oh, no, there we go. You might as well have committed murder. Boy, that's a heavy standard. That's a heavy standard. And you know, you look at Jesus and the confrontations that he had with the Jewish leaders. You look at Jesus and the confrontations he had even with his own disciples. And there was only once, maybe twice, where he got really angry. But it was righteous anger when he went into the temple and he saw how the people were abusing those who had come to worship. Be ye perfect. He talks about adultery. He said, no problem, no problem. You've been married for years, you've been faithful to your wife, but then he says, you remember Jimmy Carter? 
If you've ever looked at another with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery. Oh, no. If you ever, ever thought about something that you might... Uh, I could get deep in the weeds in this, but we know that in this country, pornography is a problem. We know that fantasies and all kinds of things are being played out all over the place. And, and we say, well, I've been faithful. And yet, some have engaged in these things. And Jesus said, you've done any of that, that's, that's adultery. He tackles divorce. And, and when he gets into the subject of divorce, too, this is a, a, an itchy subject. But he says, if you get divorced and get remarried, you're committing what? Adultery. And you say, no, no, we, we, we're beyond that. We're an advanced society. We understand. Well, he talks about oaths then. And he says, is it, it's wrong to swear by anything. So be careful what you swear by. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. And you know, we know people like that. When they give you their word, it's like a bond. And we know other people that when they say, yeah, I'll see you there on Friday at 2 o'clock and they never show up. You swear you're going to be there? Oh, yeah, I'll be there. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Jesus is laying out in this passage all the things that one would need to do to be perfect. And as we kind of go through these things, and as the disciples and those who were hearing him said, boy, I'll tell you, it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to be like Jesus. He talks about revenge. And he says, forget about it. Instead, offer grace. Turn the other cheek. Don't resist evil. And if someone does something, they want your coat, give them your coat. Give them your shoes, too, or whatever. Trust God to even the scales. You talk about difficult things, difficult calling. You know, I don't think I want to follow Jesus if life has to be this tough. And then Jesus caps it all off by this phrase, be perfect like God is perfect. And we say we can't do that. But that's the point. You see, Jesus is trying to lay this out in the beginning of his ministry that we can't be perfect, that, that we fall short of the glory of God, and the only way we're ever going to get anywhere in God's kingdom is to rely on his grace. It's his grace that makes us whole, that makes us complete, that allows us to live and to live to the glory of God. So when we constantly try to live up to the expectations of others, putting unrealistic expectations, putting unrealistic expectations on ourselves or even trying to live up to what we believe God wants us to do, we're going to always fall short. It just goes to show that no one is perfect. And, and Paul says in Romans 3, all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of the God. You think about the most perfect person you know. And you say, they've never done. Mother Teresa. I think if you were to talk face to face with Mother Teresa when she was living and asked her, you know, Mother, you're You're perfect. She would say, no, no, you don't know what I know about me. You see, we all have sinned. Paul knew that. God gave him that insight. Truth is, we all know it, even when we pretend. Even when we say, well, we're pretty good. <laughs> I'm a lot better than, and you name the person. We try to compare ourselves, and, and uh, but none of us are perfect. You see, we have this human weakness with its propensity to turn from God, to sin, to do our own thing. And it's only by the grace of God and through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ that we can find our perfection. It's through Him and Him alone that we can achieve this. And that's why we come to the communion table, to remember that it is by Christ alone that we can be saved. We can't do it. I can't be the perfect Christian. And neither can you. But in Christ, all things are possible. So when we think we can do it on our own, we're thumbing our noses at God and we're saying, hey, who needs you? We're better than you. And that's sin. That's human pride. Now let me say this. I want to go back to this idea of striving for excellence rather than perfection. Don't get me wrong. We shouldn't try to do our best. It's all about the motivation and the process. Once you've recognized, it all, once you've recognized all that God has done for you, then your motivation becomes honoring God. 
you want to do your best for him. It's kind of like some children, you want to please your parents, right? And that's why you do so much. Or you're on a sports team, you want to please your coach, right? Or, or you're in school, you want to please your teacher. Or you're at work and you want to please your, 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 your boss. But that's why Paul says what you need to do is you need to do everything for God. So you might have a human boss, you might have a human coach, you might have a human spouse, you might have a, a human father or mother. But when we live our lives seeking excellence to do everything to the glory of God, it makes a difference. And not only will God bless it, but it, you'll be a blessing to others as well. So when we have a Tim Tebow or Carrie Underwood get up on the stage and says, I want to thank God, I want to give the glory to Jesus. I know the world criticizes that. But you know that their motivation for being the very best is not for themselves, but for the glory of God. And because they've done this for God, their souls are rejoicing. When you get an A on your report card or when you get a promotion at work for a job well done, it's not for your glory, it's for God's glory. And all your hard work is paid off and your faithfulness is being rewarded. And we should always be working and doing our very best, even if it doesn't turn out to be perfect. I remember when I was in seminary, I had the opportunity to hear Gardner Taylor. He was the, uh, one of the, the top ten preachers in the United States and uh, had a big church in New York City. It traveled all over the world preaching in Billy Graham-like style. And uh, I remember hearing him preach, and he said, he said this, and I, I took offense at it. He said, you know, when you're in the pulpit, you can only expect to give about 10 excellent messages a year. And I got angry because I said, every time I go into the pulpit, I swing for a homer, I, I try for the mark. I'm not going to accept the fact that I can only do 10 excellent sermons. Some of you might be saying, I hope he gets three. <laughs> but every time you get up in the pulpit, every time you get up to do something, we're called to strive for excellence. You know, Gardner Taylor, he pre somebody told me afterwards, they said, he preaches that same sermon everywhere he goes. <laughs> He's only got one. <laughs> That's not true, I'm sure. But when we're doing our very best, whether we get a trophy or not, whether we win the championship or not, if we've done our very best, if we've striven for excellence, we've practiced, we've worked hard, and we give the glory to God, you will have the satisfaction. And I think that's the problem with the world. We're always trying to do it for someone else. And we're never satisfied. And we're chasing this. The problem comes with perfection is that it's always fleeting. Gibson never repeated that perfect season. Our satisfaction comes in striving for excellence and knowing that we did it to please God. That's where we should put our energy. To thank Him for His saving grace and His presence in our life. Then we can call on Christ to help us achieve our best in all we do because it allows us to praise him and to please him. You know, Lori and I, and I'm telling the tales, Lori was an A student all through high school and through college, and she was at the top everywhere she went. And, uh, you know, I, I was a good student in high school near the top of my class, got into college, and I floundered a lot. And, um, you know, when we started dating, you know, and I, I my grades improved immediately <laughs> because the ex I had, well, if I wanted to be with Lori, I had to study. So, okay, well, that was kind of fun and everything like that. And, and I remember saying to her one time, I said, you know, I says, it's easy to get an A or a B if you study and go to class. <laughs> but then I remember I was getting ready to take a test, and, um, and uh, we were talking about our approaches to that, and Lori studied, she did well and whatnot, and, and I said... I said to her one day, I said, I said oh, I've got this really tough test. I'm just praying that I get a, a, an A. <laughs> and she says, if you study hard enough, you won't have to pray for it. <laughs> very practical advice. Lori's very practical. But what I said is, no, I'm not praying that I get an A. What I pray when I go into every test is that, that God will help me to remember and recall all that I've studied 
and I won't have any mental blanks, and that I will be able to do the best of my ability on what I have prepared to do. And I, and I said, that's how I approach my prayer in school. And I think if we approach life that way, that if we strive for excellence, we strive to do our best, and then we invite God into that process, we are going to have much greater satisfaction because it means walking hand in hand with Jesus throughout our lives, not just for eternal salvation, which is important, but in everything we do, He's a part of that. It means calling on Him and leaning on Him at times to do the hard stuff, to battle through to the end on a project to get things done and to know that He will be with us through that. You see, you want to know why we can't be more like Jesus? Because when Jesus had the hard stuff, where did He go? He went to His Father and He spent time with God and they were then able to go and face the hard stuff. If you want to be more like Jesus, that's what you and I need to do. So stop chasing after perfection. Instead, draw closer to Christ. Invite Him into your lives and follow Him. Let Him lead and show you the way. Let Him bless you so you can bless others and then do everything to the glory of God. Let, them be, let that be your goal. And excellence will soon be found in all you do. Not perfection, because only Christ is perfection. But excellence will be the trademark and God will receive the glory. That's what our calling is. That's what we should strive for instead of perfection. Strive for the glory of God. Amen. We're going to now come to the table to come to the one who was perfect, who became the perfect sacrifice, and who allows us to be able to live to the glory of God. And again, this table that we come to today is not the table of this church. And so after we sing the hymn, we invite you to participate, to receive the bread and the cup, and to know that God loves you and that God is with you. We're going to sing now, Break Thou the Bread of Life. It's number 315 in the hymnal. We're going to sing verses 1.